So I'm going to talk today about a very short, crucial, but very short period in John Lewis's life. From the spring of 1959 to the, to the, to the spring of 1960. So it's really a little bit less than 12 months, but it's this absolutely central time where he develops his particular approach to nonviolence. He's going to go on to call it the nonviolent anvil, so he really sees nonviolence as a weapon. And if at the end people have questions about the kinds of nonviolence uh, that were involved in the movement in addition to his, I'd be happy to dive into that. But I wanted to be clear from the beginning that we're just talking about a very small piece of his long career, and we're talking about one strand of nonviolence, and there are, as I'm sure many people in the audience know, many strands of it. But his long and storied career begins when he's only 19 years old and first joins the movement. So Joanne mentioned March, the book that this is the focus of Durham Reads. And this really is an incredibly moving portrait of his, among other things, his emotional life during this time. Uh, this is the initial of his 45 arrests. And he says in the book, quote, the first time I was arrested was in 1960. I felt free, he said. It made me stronger. And he was a part of a sit-in at a segregated restaurant. I wanted to just show you a little bit of what this looked like. This is unfortunately a 1964 slide, so it's a little bit of a photo you know, photographic lie. But it's 1964 in Nashville, and he's being arrested. This is his seventh arrest, um, again, for uh, protesting a segregated um, restaurant. The following year, he joins the Freedom Rides. And he's in the original group of 13. In the spring of 61, it's hard to imagine how uh, intense of an experience this was. They met at a Chinese restaurant in Washington, D.C. The, the, there were six white riders and seven black riders, and they had a little room at the back of the restaurant, and they actually said a prayer where um, you know, they felt like this might be the last meal they had together. Um, and, and they get on the bus the next morning, and, and John Lewis was the first of the riders to be attacked in Rock Hill, South Carolina. He was beaten unconscious in the Greyhound Station, a little bit later in Montgomery, Alabama. From 1963 to 66, he served as chair of SNCC and then worked in community organizations sort of all around Atlanta between, the, uh, between 66 and his election to city council in Atlanta in 1981. Again, he works a little bit uh, within city council, and then in 1987, he begins uh, his service, which has continued since that time, of ser serving as Georgia's fifth district representative to the U.S. Congress. In that time since 87, when he was elected to U.S. Congress, his major issues uh, that he's fought for include economic fairness, equal access to bank loans, gender equality, gay rights, immigration reform, and above all, the right to vote. I'll, it, if people are interested, too, at the end, we can talk a little bit about what's happened uh, in terms of his activism since the Supreme Court decided last summer um, to eviscerate uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And that's a pretty interesting story as well. So all of this lifetime of activism uh, starts with a question for him. How does he move from the idea in his head, all people should be equal, to making it happen? And so today I'm going to talk about these very early months when, as a teenager, he begins to find a systematic way to act. It sounds like kind of facile, but it's really one of the most profound political questions we have, right? How do you move from the idea of fairness and equality to the actual making it happen on the ground? It's this early journey between 1959 and 1960 where he's really on the absolute fringes of the movement that leads him to the center of American politics, where he's part of a small group, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, which is pronounced SNCC. And this small group, which until 1964 is less than 150 people, uh, forces the country to live out its reality, uh, the, the, the reality of its mission statement, right? The we're promised one person, one vote, and SNCC forces the country to live up to it. So the story starts in Nashville, where Lewis is a student. He's uh, at American Baptist. He's very earnest. He's devout. He's from a uh, rural part of Alabama, Troy, Alabama. And he's very much drawn to a young minister who's just returned from India named James Lawson. Now, Lawson looks a little severe here. He actually has an enormously vibrant personality and sense of humor. But I think this slide is not a bad one because he's an incredibly powerful intellect as well as charismatic thinker um, and, and emotionally uh, 
powerful person. Lawson has come to Nashville at this time as a field secretary for a group called the Fellowship of Reconciliation. It's abbreviated for. And Lewis is totally into this guy because, and I'm going to ask Joanne if she doesn't mind passing these around to people, and, and maybe you can take a look at them once the lights come back up. But Four has just put out this comic in 1957. So it's two years have gone by since this comic came out. Um, this is a really wonderful piece of history, so for people who like that kind of thing. Um, but it's also just a great record of how people were telling the story of the Montgomery bus boycott in the late 50s because people didn't know how to replicate it, right? So Montgomery had happened and then nothing. Little Rock and then nothing. So it was kind of this lull in the movement. So Lawson comes to town. Lewis knows for the Fellowship of Reconciliation because of their uh, publication of this comic book but that, that you're having passed around. And the vivid graphics and the clear examples of the dignity of noncompliance wound up being devoured by college students, black college students across the country at this time. So uh, again, when the lights come back up, take a look just at how the people who are engaging in the bus boycott are portrayed, uh, physically portrayed. It's a really profound um, piece of, of graphic history. So when Jim Lawson first offers a workshop in Nashville under the sponsorship of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, Lewis says, quote, this is something I've got to attend. So in the spring of 1959, again, this is about 10 months before the Greensboro sit-ins, the Nashville branch of Dr. King's organization, the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference, took the first step of what Lawson termed a nonviolent scientific method. So he had three areas he really wanted people to look at. One was investigation. One was a research project, and the third was focus. So he had people, about 20 people, lay people as well as um, members of American Baptist and Vanderbilt uh, Vanderbilt's Divinity School, including women. And together they surveyed the needs of Nashville's black community. So not only were they targeting white and colored signs, but when I first asked Lawson to tell me this story, he went into great detail for about 15 minutes about what Nashville was like. And I said, I know, I, you know, I, I know what Nashville is like. And he was like, no, you don't. Right? No, you don't. So this is just part of the longer quote. But he said, <coughs> we, wanted to aim, we aimed to break open job opportunities for people. There were no black cashiers in downtown Nashville. There were no black bank tellers. There were no black secretaries working in corporate offices. There were no black reporters at the two newspapers. There were no black folk in communications with a few council, with the exception of a few council persons, city government was wholly segregated. Nashville had a large pool of African American professionals and there were no blacks in the police department hierarchy and other city services are on the bench. Black lawyers had a tough time in the courts because of the abject racism. There were segregated restrooms in the courthouse, the lack of reading facilities for black lawyers. And he just kept, kept going, laying out what downtown Nashville was like. Black teachers, he said at this time, had only recently won an incredibly hard-fought court battle for equal salaries. So that's just a little visual of Nash Nashville at that time. So he invites these people to a workshop, and it really signals the future of the movement in the South. So discussions routinely grow heated in the fall, or spring and fall of 1959 in these workshops of 20 or less people. And they range over a whole uh, huge number of topics. So they're talking about education and segregation of the schools, police brutality and harassment of black people, the segregated job market, and meager job opportunities. And the Nashville group in May of 59 decides to launch a campaign to desegregate na downtown Nashville. And for those of you who've been paying attention to Ferguson and other places, I think it's really important to note here that they envisioned in the, f in the spring of 59 that it would be a 10 or 15 year struggle however long it would take. So this created a much larger task. Na uh, Jim Lawson was 32 at this time, and he imagined this would be sort of the, the major bulk of his life's work uh, to sort of take what had happened in, Mo in Montgomery with the bus boycott and spread it throughout the society, so not just the buses, but a whole range of institutions. Based upon that tenant, Lawson recalled, quote, I began to draw up the plan for workshops in September of 59. He didn't really have to work too hard to recruit students. So the word spreads through social and church networks that he's doing this, uh, which is, and the this there is developing practical tactics that people can access to, to fight segregation. And, and remember, in Nashville at this time, there are many black institutions of higher education. So there's Fisk, Tennessee State, Mahari Medical School, Vanderbilt, uh, which has just integrated, um, and American Baptist. So a year earlier, in, in 58, we rarely had 10 people in the room Lewis noted. 
in his first memoir, uh, Walking with the Wind. By the fall of 59, there were often more than 20, black and white alike, women as well as men, unquote. So Lawson is now looking to create a movement that will involve thousands of people. He, he begins to talk about, hey, we don't need a PR man, we need a program at the local level, a wide movement of nonviolence. And it's this time that the movement expands to include people like Diane Nash and uh, Lewis's roommate, uh, Bernard Lafayette, and James Bevel, who will all go on to be very important architects of the movement in the South. So five months before Greensboro, sort of electrifies the nation, the Nashville group sets out to teach itself the tenets of nonviolence. And how does that happen? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the nitty gritty. They go initially intellectually into the history of this. So they look at nonviolence from the early Christians. Uh, they pause at length on the New Testament concepts of love. They discuss John Woolman's efforts against slavery, William Penn's experiment to peacefully coexist with Native Americans in colonial Pennsylvania and the freedom rides that happened in Pennsylvania, New England in the early 18, uh, 1840s against slavery. And then Lawson says, and for the last three years I've been in Nagpur, India, and he talks about his, his uh, quest to sort of figure out how nonviolence in India had unfolded. He stressed, quote, the Gandhian idea of our being engaged in an experiment where you have to keep figuring out what happened and why and what didn't happen. And it, any of you who, who know Lawson will know that he's still at it, right? He's still trying to figure it out and he's still working. Um, he lives in Los Angeles and has been very involved there in the police community uh, relations since um, the late 80s. So through historical example, he taught them something that became centrally useful as the civil rights struggle in Nashville intensifies, how to reflect on and analyze their experiences before they act again. And again, later in the movement, this will become less and less available for people, that slow time to reflect, right? Because the movement is happening so fast and violence is so fast and furious from the outside that people have less access to that reflective time. So the point is that Lawson was introducing into the culture of black Nashville, not an intellectual tradition of nonviolence only, although that's true, a nonviolent tradition stretching through so many Eastern and Western religions, but he also accomplishes something much more profound he brought these settled positions to people who were trying to find a way to act. And here's what Lewis says. Remember, Lewis is 19. Quote, this was eye-opening stuff for me, learning that the feelings I'd had as a boy, the exclusion and unfairness that I had witnessed growing up in Alabama, the awful segregation that surrounded all of us there in Nashville throughout this entire nation, it was nothing new, unquote. Lawson found he could draw on his experiences as a conscientious objector. He'd been in a... Uh, a conscientious objector in the Korean War, to lead students through an examination of the history of the early Christians down through Indian str India's struggle for independence. And so for Lewis, he simply found the workshops, quote, mind-blowing. So I asked him, did you learn something? You know, like, what kind of learning happened? And he like, looked at me like I was crazy. What do, you, what do you mean learning? Quote, to learn that the tension between what was right and what was wrong that had torn at me since I was old enough to think that it had a historic context, that people of all cultures and all ages had struggled with the same issues, the same questions, the same brutal realities, that was mind-blowing." Finally, after that, um, after about four weeks, they examined the Montgomery bus boycott. We started mostly with talk, Lewis recalled, but later we turned to what we called sociodrama. I'm gonna come back to sociodrama in just a second. But in essence, they relived the Montgomery bus boycott from its early planning through its the first carpool to the final action uh, one year and several days later when they integrate the buses. So in this manner, the workshops begin to fundamentally reshape the young students' sense of political possibility. So I'm gonna pause here for just a minute and ask you to look at some of these slides. Again, I'm a little bit fudging this historically. The, the best slides that we have of what is happening inside of these workshops are from a Life magazine spread from Petersburg, Virginia, but some of the um, concepts that Lawson brought across, he then shared with many other people who were part of the SCLC, and one of those people took these techniques to Petersburg, and there happened to be a light photographer there, and so caught the workshops from the inside out. So one of the things that they would do is take uh, young people from the ages of about 10 through 20, and they'd say, look, we don't think it's natural and normal to be nonviolent, so we're gonna have to subject you to some things. It's a practice, it's a trial run, and see how you do with it. So this was the spill test where this young boy with a bow tie 
and the young man sitting next to him had had a whole soda spilled over across the table, which is what some of the white uh, clerks and waitresses did when people would sit in, right? So they spilled them, and the per point was to stay in your seat and hold your ground. Same thing with smoking. So you'd see white toughs come in and surround the sit-inners, and they'd blow smoke in their face and up their nose and so forth. These are young people um, in the back there with the cigarettes who are trying to act like those white thugs that they're going to encounter. And the young people are in their Sunday best and they're you know, trying to stay focused on their studies. And again, some of the worst violence included cigarettes. So um, people would not only ash into people's hair, but put cigarettes on people's bodies. So they would do that. The man, by the way, to the left there, um, is um, was Dr. King's executive secretary for many years um, and is a um, well-known, um, I wouldn't say adversary of John Lewis. They were close in many ways, but, but um, Wyatt Walker was a very hierarchical traditional minister, and John Lewis and SNCC were very, uh, wanted to flatten that <laughs> hierarchy. And so, um, but that he's an incredible lion of the civil rights movement. So this is what happened. These young people sort of show how they're standing around the outside. They're sort of on the outside of this group, right? And the young people standing around will watch what's happening with the, with the role play and then debrief. So Lawson took people through that time and again. And they, he said, you've got to do this four or five times before you can actually do a sit-in. Um, because otherwise, you can't tell whether you're going to react violently when there's an actual incident. Um, and if you, you do react violently, then that's going to ruin it for everyone else. So you've got to imagine a young 19-year-old John Lewis going through this kind of experience. And what he says um, about it, I think, is the best, uh, the best insider's view that we have in writing of it. And he says, <clears throat> told for so many years by parents and other authorities not to discuss the way segregation made me feel, the words once let loose would not stop, would not stop unquote. All of the young people in this workshop had suffered indignities of Jim Crow. They'd sat in the ragged balconies of movie theaters. They lived on unpaved streets. They'd been denied seats on a bus. All attended elementary and secondary schools transparently inferior to nearby white schools. Many had seen siblings, parents, and in the most difficult cases, grandparents humiliated by whites, or worse, without consequence. So talking inside of the, of the workshops about these profoundly personal incidents as a group, they realized in a new way how a lifetime of such experiences could diminish a person's sense of self. And so this is where both Lawson and Lewis describe a menacing existential fear that had a sort of control of many of the people who lived in the Jim Crow South. Inside of the workshop, however, participants began to share these private stories and they recognized that it was possible to hold higher expectations of themselves and of the broader society. And they brought this new understanding to their recruits, right? So if a friend, uh, if you came home from one of these workshops and your friend said, wow, you know, you look really excited, what happened? And then the next time they would bring that person back to the workshop. So the workshops are self-recruiting. Um, and they noted after a few months that segregation, quote, made thousands of Negroes, this is Diane Nash, thousands of Negroes feel that they are nobodies and that they have no right to aspire to noble things. But then they identified that segregation, not individual weakness, was the wicked thing because it penalizes a person for being what God has made him. So inside of the workshops, together they're discovering and experiencing this new reality. Alongside of that, they're figuring out how to apply Gandhian philosophy to their own lives. So Lewis later notes the beauty of the ideas lay in their practicality. I could take this anywhere. Quote, they applied to real life, to the specifics of the world where we, where we walked. They applied to Bird's Drug Store and to the Troy, Alabama Theater. They applied to the buses I rode to high school and to the all-black classes in which I sat. They applied to the men and women who refused to serve black people at the lunch counters of downtown Nashville. Unquote. So Lawson pushes them, and they push each other to talk through the reasons why they should not honor the impulse to fight back. Lawson recalled it as a, quote, mutual learning process. The notion of self-defense is essential, he stated, quote, but it doesn't necessarily mean only violence. I don't know about you all, but this was, this was and still is an incredibly difficult concept for me. He says that fighting back can happen nonviolently. People might be reluctant to admit it, but most, it, most people resist insults, he claims, 
and subsequent hostile situations by turning the other cheek. Quote, folk who believe so much in violence fail to recognize that in violence somebody always loses. It's a strategy that's only ever 50% effective, unquote. On the other hand, when nonviolent approaches work, quote, it's a win-win for everybody when you don't retaliate with a personal insult but instead offer a friendly, generous gesture. That's what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek. You cause the other person to do searching, unquote. Now, Lawson is infamous for saying and doing this time and time again in his own life. So the young Nashville students actually see him. They're traveling with him on a bus. A guy who's got a motorcycle pulls up to the bus. He sees Lawson get off the front, and he spits at Lawson right in the face. And Lawson, without a missing a beat, asks the guy for a handkerchief. And the student, and the guy hands him one. I'm sorry, this guy in a leather jacket, right, pulls out a handkerchief and hands Lawson the handkerchief, which he uses to wipe his face. Hands him back, and they start bantering about sports. And the students see this, and they think Lawson is a crazy prophet, or crazy, or a prophet, or both, right? They can't figure him out. And it's a really compelling example of, of how he sort of moved through the world and continues to move through the world, right? You cause the other person to do searching. The students always ask, what if the guy is crazy? Like, so the motorcycle guy was maybe a jerk, but not crazy. What do you do if the person has a real criminal mind and insults you again and pushes you some more, or you know, you're down on the ground and he keeps pounding on you? And Lawson says, quote, that can happen, but a good part of the time, the hostile person experiences surprise at your response and feels inward chagrin and or shame and or inward disturbance that they acted so chauvinistically and the other person acted graciously, unquote. So again, the experience of thinking through and debating the various responses took a lot of time and energy, in some cases an enormous amount of time. I think it's important to note Lawson was not married when he first came to Nashville, and then he gets married about a year after. It's a few years before he has a child. So he's young, and he has time, and he sits with these students and talks with them for many, many hours. He meets with them at least once a week as a group. He taught them patience and persistence. And at the center of the workshop, a very different ethic develops that is not widespread in the civil rights movement. Um, the ethic of compassion is widespread within the movement, but this patient, persistent reflection is much harder to find. Now, as that's unfolding in the fall of 1959, Lawson starts talking to, he starts using this phrase, we're working to create the beloved community. The first time Lawson uses this phrase, John Lewis immediately found it gave definition to his own vision. In the workshops, he says, they began to understand this as, quote, nothing less than the Christian concept of the kingdom of God on earth, unquote. He says, throughout human existence, people from ancient and western, I'm sorry, ancient eastern and western societies up through the present day have strive strived toward community, toward coming together. And though this community might be delayed or interrupted by evil, hatred, greed, or revenge, or the lust for power, Believers in the beloved community insist that it's the moral responsibility of men and women with soul force, people of goodwill, to respond and to struggle nonviolently against the forces that stand between a society and the harmony it naturally seeks. So again, put yourself back to 1959. This vision that he lays out and develops for himself inside of the Lawson workshops is one that you'll see at the end of the presentation today when I tell you about his arrest a year ago. He's got the same moral compass and he's seen it play out in many different situations and issues, but it's that same striving to put yourself and your body on the line to sort of stand between evil and um, its ability to flourish in the world. The struggle to do this, Diane Nash, Nash wrote in 1961, freed each individual to, quote, grow and produce to his fullest capacity. So this phrase, the beloved community, has had a terrible interim 50 years, right? People kind of see it as kumbaya and idealistic and it's never going to happen. Um, but for the people at the time in 1959, um, and I would argue through probably late 1962, the phrase summarizes uh, not just for Lewis and Nash, but for the hundreds and later thousands who will join in its pursuit, a real vision of the world that they wanted to create, where, quote, the barriers between people gradually came down and where the citizenry made a constant effort to address even the most difficult problems of ordinary people. So it's a really uh, horizontal vision, not a top-down um, vision. And, and one way to think about this is to say that the community itself that they were trying to create represents the group's ability 
to live in the solution. And that's going to become hugely contested by the mid-60s. Um, but at the time, that's how people who were in it, including Lewis, expressed uh, its power. So at this point, the students in Nashville could now consider Lawson's example, right? Go back to the street tough and spitting and asking for the handkerchief in a new light. How could they reproduce this kind of dramatic initiative in different settings? They began to ask, what would I do if somebody spat on me? How would I respond if somebody called me a black bitch? How can I claim my dignity when a white person calls me boy? And they keep asking themselves this and sort of testing one another. And so they try in that context of the workshops, which are private, right? They're in the basement of a church to take ownership of their public life, not only their own public conduct, but also the overall environment in which they interacted with whites. It understates their achievement to see this as an effort to alter customs of white supremacy. Even if the object was such a sweeping set of rules as the Southern caste system, they succeeded, right, where thousands and thousands of others had tried but failed. They created and innovated concrete ways to challenge an entire array of deferential behavior and ideas. So they would review what happened in the street between Lawson and the white tough, and then they'd continue to practice the technical skills needed to assert themselves nonviolently as equal citizens. And here's what Lewis says about it. Quote, we actually acted out roles trying to foresee the varieties of possible alternatives and how we could apply nonviolence to different situations, unquote. Parents had warned them that, you know, challenging segregation meant certain harm and possible death. But Lawson's example demonstrated a new way that they could claim the respect and dignity that seg segregation systematically denied them. And furthermore, it offers this prospect of uh, doing so without engaging in physical violence. And so they felt like it brought people much nearer the day when they could act on their own, not just during one sit-in, but in numerous situations under varying conditions. So I would argue that in political terms, the Lawson workshops allowed individuals to move from private talk to public action, not once, but again and again, and they would refine it each time. And so <coughs> in doing that, they are a, a much, um, it would be, I don't want to overstate this, but they're not a usual cadre of 19 and 20 year olds, right? They've been through this incredibly intense experience, and when they begin to run into other 19 and 20 year olds in the spring of 1960 who've also engaged in sit-ins in Jacksonville, Florida, in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, throughout the urban South, they are different. The Nashville group is different. And so they run into these folks. This is a, a picture of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which comes together about two months after the uh, first sit-ins in Greensboro. So in April of 1960, this, the group of students around the urban South who've s sat in gather at Shaw College here in Raleigh. They create the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, the Nashville group that's been through the Lost in Workshops is uh, among the most coherent, self-possessed, and powerful. And so what they're trying to do in Shaw, at Shaw in uh, April of 1960 is export what's happened, their experiential lessons, into this larger group. And so to get their ideas across to others who had not shared the same experiences, and, Lo and Lewis is absolutely at the center of this, um, the Nashville people found it necessary to do, <laughs> to do what they called taking on virtually the entire conference. So you've got to imagine these are all young people who've all succeeded um, in their sit-ins, right? They've, they've been active on their campuses or in the towns near their campuses. And Lewis says they took on the whole conference. Quote, a great deal of debate and a great deal of discussion and even verbal fights on the whole question of nonviolence promptly ensued. Some people, explained Lewis, quote, opposed the whole idea of basing the movement on the Judeo-Christian heritage, a belief in love and nonviolence, unquote. The Nashville students, particularly Lewis, Nash, and Bevel, uh, had thought through and acted through a great many of the key components of the nonviolent message, and perhaps most important, their most recent victories, including desegregating Nashville's lunch counters, made them very persuasive. So as Diane Nash said, we had won. Success made us very persuasive. So it marks the beginning of the Nashville era of SNCC, and this is a period between 1960 and 63, where those Nashville students with John Lewis at the center really provides a formative influence on the organization as a whole. I do think it's important to note that nonviolence was embattled from SNCC within the from the start, 
So there's sort of this notion that we all started nonviolent and happy at the beginning of the 60s, and by, the, by 1965, people had become disillusioned and that they turned towards self-defense. And I think that that's, um, the evidence does not bear that out. From the very beginning in 1960, people advocated for both positions and many other positions as well, in part because nobody could figure out to, how to do what Lawson did, right? How do you, when somebody spits on you, immediately ask that person for a handkerchief? What are the, what are the specifics of doing that in each case? And can you do that in each case? Um, the fact that this struggle went on verified a really tenacious truth about the emerging movement. Almost everyone at Shaw in April 1960, and in this next really important SNCC gathering that October, could be understood as an activist. Almost all had been to jail. They had all gotten their feet wet, yet most of them had not lived through this in uh, extended evaluative reflective training workshop, even remotely akin to what Nashville students had rung themselves through in 59 and 60. And so consequently, almost all of them lacked a commitment to what Lawson called revolutionary nonviolence, grounded in recently honed values in each person, but hammered out collectively amidst this slow, long, candid, con confrontative conversations within the workshops. So I'm just going to mention that people, uh, both Nash and Lewis, have talked about people needing to grow into a commitment to nonviolence, and that gives you a little bit of a picture of what that um, long-term pattern looked like. But most people did not see nonviolence as a powerful alternative to the status quo. It certainly did not characteri characterize many or even most approaches used within the 300-year-long black freedom struggle. It did not easily mesh with southern black political traditions where most African Americans living in the rural south followed Ida B. Wells' 1892 council that a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home. And it should be used for that protection which the law refuses to give. So I would say that nonviolence was clearly aberrant, and when John Lewis encountered Lawson, this was a great exception. Indeed, the SNCC activists would soon find the house of veteran Mississippi civil rights activists like Amzi Moore veritable armed fortresses. Um, so these, uh, when they go to Mississippi to start doing the voting rights campaigns, they're working largely with World War II vets um, who are absolutely armed. Um, and as Stokely Carmichael notes, um, which I think is a really important point, in American cultural terms, this is his quote, quote, particularly the cowboy, mountain man, outlaw, carbine and six-gun culture of the American frontier, which has been popularized throughout the media, nonviolence is clearly aberrant, unquote. So Lawson's workshop here serves as a method to recruit and develop leaders into a movement that was very non-traditional. First, these students were discovering, and, and maybe a better word is experiencing, a community of like-minded individuals who increasingly felt responsible for themselves individually and for one another. Second, they learned how to bring forth their own finest instincts under the greatest pressures through their capacities to imagine a just world and act on that vision. Third, as Bernard Lafayette later explained, Lawson seminars brought both the religious and the political components of his life together. I don't think that can be underestimated, thereby making him feel whole. For many people, all three reasons were interwoven, making these workshops, as John Lewis said simply, quote, the most important thing we were doing, unquote. Lawson's workshops thus recruited John Lewis not only into the movement, but into a very specific belief system within the movement, the belief in nonviolence as a way of life. I think it is only fair to tell you that this was a very specialized and rare experience, that most, most people practice nonviolence um, for specific reasons. So um, there's sort of three kinds of nonviolence. The one is that you see up there first, and it's the most well-known, is just, I'm going to use this when it works, right? Strategic nonviolence. I don't believe in nonviolence as a way of life. If somebody beats me, I'm going to beat back. But, but I'm going to use it where it works, especially if it brings in the northern media. I'm going to use it if I can get um, people to see the moral rightness of my cause. The second kind is survival nonviolence. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And the third is what Lewis and Nash and Bernard Lafayette practice, right? This nonviolence as a way of life. It, they literally felt like if they could use nonviolence in this way, it took them out forever of the role of victim. 
So I just want to give you a little bit, some examples here. Ruby Dora Smith was a 17-year-old um, college student when she first went to Parchman Prison on the um, Freedom Ride. And at first, she was a believer in philosophical nonviolence. She believed in it so much that when she went to Parchman, which is this um, sort of the scariest prison in the Mississippi prison system, um, she wouldn't cooperate at all with anybody. Uh, she wouldn't eat. She wouldn't shower. Um, she refused to acknowledge it when the guards talked to her because she felt like that was cooperating with evil. And so when they drug her out of her cell and uh, scrubbed her with a wire brush, she continued, right? I am not going to participate at all. She did not defend herself. Um, so that's sort of where she was as a 17-year-old. Now, between 62 and 64, she evolves into a much more uh, strategic nonviolent position. I'm only going to use nonviolence when it works. Other than that, I'm going to defend myself. Um, so she's a really good example of somebody who begins there but moves um, to a much different position by uh, mid-64. Um, if I don't think we have time right now, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about putting yourself in her shoes. I'll come back to this if we have time. Uh, but there's a picture of her in the middle, and Stokely Carmichael is to her, um, her left, our right. Survival nonviolence is when that's all you can do, right? So Charlie Cobb, who was uh, doing voter registration in rural Mississippi, Rolling Forks, Mississippi in 62, he and his friend Ivanhoe Donaldson are canvassing, trying to get people to register. Uh, two white guys in a pickup truck, one who's in a police car, uh, or police uniform, roll up onto the lawn of the house where they're canvassing. They pull out uh, revolvers and stick them uh, to the heads of Ivanhoe and, and Charlie Cobb. And at that point, they decide the only response that they have is to talk down these crazy white people, right? And so that's what he does. Now, he does not believe in nonviolence as a, as a philosophical approach. Uh, he wouldn't even call that strategic nonviolence. He's just making sure he uh, gets to canvas another day. Um, but Lewis is different, and Lewis is there in the top row standing to the left. Um, this is him on that night. Uh, this is right outside of the Chinese restaurant as they're getting ready to go from D.C. down. They're trying to make it to New Orleans. And this is him when he's arrested. Um, he's going to use this kind of deep philosophical nonviolence throughout that time period. And this is, you know, two weeks. He leaves Washington, D.C. He's beaten unconscious in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and he gets back on the bus. I don't think that makes a lot of sense to most of us unless we can understand something about what happened to him in that workshop. He's going to use that approach despite his friend in SNCC kind of ridiculing him, even mocking him, um, all the way through um, this most iconic of confrontations. So this is March of 1965, the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Uh, that's Lewis with the uh, khaki trench coat and the backpack on uh, leading the march. And then that's him being hit by an Alabama state trooper on the right, top right. And then right below is, of course, a few months later in August of 65, Lyndon Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act. So throughout that time period from the Freedom Rides of 61 all the way through 65, he has this tenacious ability to stick to nonviolence. Um, I'm going to argue that he and others, some of whom used nonviolence and some of whom did not, they set in motion a true overthrow of political white supremacy. And, and how they do that is, is complicated. And Lewis's approach is only part of the situation. But here's just a visual of the black belt, right? So once they have uh, passed the Voting Rights Act, all of those dark, the, the blackened parts of the map, those are black majority counties in the South in 1965. So those are places where white supremacy is no longer going to be able to, to take hold after that. And he's continued to fight for voting rights. Um, in 2000, with the election of George Bush, George W. Bush, um, he made uh, an he created an incredible public awareness campaign and then raised uh, bill after bill in Congress to reform the way that um, the votes had been counted, the Supreme Court decision that came down in 2000. 
Um, in 2013, after the Supreme Court invalidates Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, he said, quote, I felt like crying. I thought, it seems like we have fought the same fight over and over, the struggle for the right to vote. And he continues to do his nonviolent political action. So I wanted to, to end that sort of journey into his 59-60 period by going back um, and having you listen to his own words. His 45th arrest came a year ago, so October of 2013. He sat in at the US Capitol to advocate for um, immigration reform. He was incredibly distressed that the first DREAM Act had been put forward in 2001, and in 2013 it still had not seen any congressional action. And so after paying a $50 cash fine, <coughs> he first stops to speak to movement supporters where he says, we all live in the same house. If any one of us is illegal, we are all illegal. There is no illegal human being. Say it with me over and over again. And then he's asked by a journalist, why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep getting arrested? Why is this your 45th arrest? So let me close with his response. I believe that we accomplished a great deal. We were trying to dramatize the issue, put a face on it. Not just members of Congress, but being there with hundreds of other people, especially dreamers, young people, children. We had to be there so they could see us supporting them, giving them a sense of hope, a sense of optimism, saying to them, you must never give up or give in or give out. And you must never lose faith that a better day is coming. You're never too old to stand up for what is right, what is fair, and what is just. If you see something that's not right, you have to speak up and speak out. Above all, you have to find a way to get in the way. Thank you. So I'd be happy as the lights come up to um, answer questions or take comments. Uh, Charlie Cobb Jr. just wrote a book. I don't remember the exact title, but dealing with guns. Mm, and that nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, what's their relationship philosophic? Oh, I'm sorry. What's the relationship between John Lewis and Charlie Cobb Jr.? You know, philosophically, anyway. Yeah. So I, I would hesitate to speak for um, for either one of them, but I'll tell you what I've learned just by talking with Charlie, especially. Um, so Charlie, as some of you may know, is at is in Durham this semester. He's he's working as a scholar activist in residence at the Center for Doc Studies, and he's working with young people, uh, undergraduates and graduate students, to to put some context around the SNCC papers that'll be at Duke, so we can understand from the point of view of people who made the history rather than just people like me, how this came to be. So that's one of the issues that they've been looking at, right? What kinds of nonviolence? How do we talk about them? If there's somebody like Ruby Doris who evolves from one kind of uh, nonviolence to another or out of it altogether, how does that work, right? So I think what Charlie would probably argue, if I if I had to guess, is that he is a he is not a supporter of philosophical nonviolence the way John Lewis is. He saw it as tactically very effective, but he was he was so angry as as many I can't imagine it would be hard to imagine how you could not be angry given the number of beatings he saw his friends experience people that he cared about um, people killed um, so for him nonviolence in the context of Mississippi and trying to achieve a voting uh, equity was simply not practical it wasn't gonna work oh I'm sorry again he does a good job in his book Talk about the, how complicated that movement was, and he deals from bottom up. Yeah. You know, talking about how the communities actually ostensibly, or maybe not <laughs> ostensibly, protected the civil rights uh, workers, especially SNCC, in right. terms of being on. In many ways. Yeah. And I think ethically, that's one of the most difficult components of the movement is that you have people who are committed to nonviolence, either philosophically or strategically, so that they can stay uh, on the moral high ground with northern funders. And yet, they're being protected in black, they're living in black homes with black, black people are, are hosting them and, and feeding them and, 
and protecting them physically, right? And that's a really hard thing, as many people who are there uh, throughout from 62 to 65 will comment that this was an, an ethically untenable situation. I just wanted to know um, if you could tell me what Charlie Carr did after he left the civil rights movement. Yeah. I know that there was a um, Dr. Ch I mean, uh, Charlie Cobb who um, was um, the head of the Commission for Racial Justice of the United Church of Christ, and I didn't know if that was the same person or not. So I can tell you a little bit about what Charlie does after 67. He works as a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee through 67. He ends up being a very significant part of the anti-Vietnam War struggle, so he goes to Hanoi in 1967. And then when he comes back from that trip, he decides to get involved in journalism, and he particularly wants to look at um, the creation of more infor accurate information about Asia and Africa within the U.S., so he tries to create some ways for journalists to talk from Africa with African-American journalists. Um, he creates something, or he's involved in the creation of something called allafrica.net, which is the fruit of that work, um, which is still ongoing today and, and for which he's a senior correspondent. He works for a while for National Geographic and travels the world doing political commentary, um, joins NPR. So most of his adult life is spent as a, a working journalist. Um, I'm very excited that he's turned to, to writing books in the last 15 years. So he wrote a book with Bob Moses called Radical Equations in 2001. If any of you are interested in doing a civil rights tour, he's written a fantastic book in 2008. Um, that takes you through from Washington, D.C., again through New Orleans. Um, I'm forgetting the, the title of this book now, but if it's his second book, he published in 2008. And then this past summer, he's made a huge splash by this new book, That Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, which, as this gentleman noted, is a really important look at what role did self defense play within the voting rights struggle. It's been kind of the under story, it hasn't been very well told by historians, and Charlie has been determined that. Not only we're we going to tell that story, but we're also going to tell the story of how crucial everyday people were in Mississippi, local leaders, and um, the people that hosted uh, both uh, organizers and, and Freedom Summer volunteers. So I'm really excited that he's telling me he's going to write a fourth book. So I have my fingers crossed. <laughs> I've just, I'm in the middle of reading uh, uh, John Lewis's Wind in the, how, I don't Walking with the Wind. Walking with the Wind. And what, so many things amaze me about this book that I can't believe it, but just how do you organize something? I, I wish there were more details in the day-to-day -day things that were done to get everything going. And also I was very struck by the people who hosted the demonstrators and the activists and putting themselves at great risk as well. I was tremendously moved by that. Thanks for your comment. I think the, the people that hosted um, civil rights workers and organizers, so f I, I'm, I'm s I would guess that many people in the audience know this, but for people doing this uh, hosting in Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi, um, there was no law they could turn to when their house was firebombed or they were fired or um, their church was uh, was bombed, right? So the people who were hosting uh, both organizers and volunteers um, were absolutely putting their houses, their mortgages, their jobs, and in many cases, their physical safety on the line. So I just want to underscore your comment. Um, your question of how do, you, how do you get things organized is the perennial one. Um, but I think it's really important to note, I've been excited about the role that um, older activists from the Panthers and SNCC are playing with the young people organizing today, both the Dream Defenders, the people who organized after the Trayvon Martin uh, murder in, in Florida, have been talking to SNCC and, and Panther veterans about this very question of how do you organize. And um, increasingly, since the Ferguson, uh, the, the killing of Michael Brown, um, there's also been a real desire to connect the generations of organizers. And so there's a, there's a website, which I encourage you to check out, called The Freedom Side, um, which shows that 
people trying to make those kinds of connections about how do you do this on a day-to-day basis? How do you organize a demonstration? What do you do afterwards? What if that doesn't work? Right, kind of what are some of your options? So there's a, I'm sorry, go ahead. So there's, there's sort of two sides of that coin, and maybe somebody over here was going to address that, that the, the personal relationships that people developed in those workshops were really important, and social media can't replace them, right? So even though it allows you to communicate rapidly across the whole world, it doesn't replace the importance of trusting somebody by working day in, day out with them, alongside of them, and figuring out who can I trust, who can I not, right? And so both are important. Did somebody over here want to make a comment? I'm sorry, yes, freedom side. If you just Google freedom and then S-I-D as in dog, E, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, um, when you were talking about John, John Lawson's workshops, um, it really made me think about Bawal and the fire, and I don't know, I don't have dates for fire or for Bawal's kind of work, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, this is Okay, so I, I don't know if which came first, but if Lawson and derived any of his ideas from Boal or... This is a good question, and I, I don't know enough to, to answer that accurately, so I would have to... That's a really good question, and one I haven't come across in my, in my work, so... So this is a young woman that I know and work with, and so I'm going to have to get back to her. But I don't know. Thanks for bringing the question, though. Did you want to? No. Anybody else? Somebody in the back. No? In the back. <laughs> um, close to my mouth, yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned the... Uh, Killing in Ferguson, and it, I guess I've just been a little bit amazed at how any sort of defense, any any, no matter how disproportionate the response, justifies the violence against African Americans. Um, as the mom of African American men, I'm just dismayed to see that any any fighting back at all um, justifies any any response, no matter how disproportionate. And then you see the, the um, people referred to as animals, as thugs, if they're not choir boys. And so, whereas I think nonviolence is difficult almost to the point of impossible for a lot of people, it, it almost feels like the only way that you can cause that other person to reflect. Because if there's even a speck, then suddenly it's all justified. So I want to thank you for the comment. And I'd almost like to just let it sit there for a minute. Um, but I do think it's important to note two things. One, while nonviolence could be an effective tactic, that there's also a very strong moral justification in our country, in our legal system, for self-defense. And that those traditions and laws must be extended to all people, particularly African-American men and particularly young African-American men, right? So any of us who have people in our families or friends who have a young man between the ages of 8 and 30, that can't go forward. Um, that can't go forward. So trying to find ways to protect those members of our community feels to me like something we need by any means necessary, not just nonviolence. I understand your point, and I think it's a really important one to tell young people about so they have access to it, and they have access to something like, like Lewis's tremendous power that he garnered from nonviolence. Right? He felt like he was no longer a victim, and that was an incredibly powerful lifelong source for him of strength. But that doesn't work for everybody and not everybody has access to Lawson or wants to take that approach. 
and I think that needs to be honored and respected and protected too and I'm I'd be happy to open the floor um, I know so many people have been thinking about this issue since since the summer so um, I don't know if people want to share some of the collective wisdom in the room yeah Doris Not to my knowledge, no. She was brutalized by the guards in Parchman. Um, these were female guards, white female. I wish that that was, well, First of all, let me say, I'm glad you're bringing that forward, and I don't know that story. So I'd love to hear more after the talk. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that that pushed people back who were committing white terror. But I would be hard-pressed to make a case evidentially that black women were safe after that. I mean, I, you know, it might have been the case for a while in that locale. But one of the real reasons why they had to do that sociodrama was because young men can't, couldn't imagine if they were in a setting where their girlfriend or their sister was attacked, not striking back, right? Because they had been taught that from childhood. You protect your family, right? You protect. So that was a major reason why they had to do the, the, the role playing. Can I ask, um, SNCC sort of grows out of S SCLC, right? In the, f in the whole, uh, SCLC's philosophy on nonviolence. King, somebody influenced King, I can't remember who, and Gandhi's, you know, whole nonviolent movement. So what was Lawson's relationship with SCLC? Because mm -hmm. it was like following up on your question was sort of a continuation right. and development of nonviolence. So he and King are the same age and, and he is a good friend. They are close. And he's a member, Lawson is a member of SCLC. In fact, he's recruited into it by King. He comes back from India. He wants to go to get his PhD. And, and he says, oh, yeah, Martin, I'll come down in a couple years after I get my PhD. And King says, no, 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 <laughs> you got to come now. you got to come now. So, so in, in uh, let's see, the very Lawson's in India when he sees Montgomery. He comes home thinking, yes, this is it. He, he meets King in Ohio in uh, the winter of 55, 56, and he's in Nashville by the following fall. I don't know how to uh, exactly express this in a question, but I've, in thinking of nonviolence or not trying to defend yourself, I'm thinking about all of the the violence, domestic violence, um, rape, so forth, of women. And the first thing about that issue is women are seen as defenseless. Mm -hmm. And they cannot defend themselves. So it's a training in a society mm -hmm. that if you if you are defenseless it doesn't protect you necessarily so your question is a, or your comment is a really powerful one if you've been socialized to not defend yourself then how can nonviolence be taking you out of victim and right and for the per per perpetrator that ex sees defenselessness and that just um, reinforces reinforces the attack so here's a Lawson-esque answer I'm not sure I buy it my own self and I have really struggled with this so I have children three boys and a girl and I have really struggled with the girl with nonviolence like it's much easier for me to teach concepts of nonviolence to the boys so I, I don't think I've got the answer. But I think what Lawson would say is he dealt with this so profoundly when he was a young man and he went to prison rather than go to war in Korea. And he said, I can't do that until I figure out what I do with prison rape. Right? If, I'm, if, if someone attacks me in prison, what am I going to do? 
And so he goes in quite length into detail. He says, I would not defend myself, but I would keep talking to the attacker on a human level throughout that and past the assault, and I would try to reach that person on a one-to-one -one human level until they could recognize and see my humanity. Now, he is a person of uncommon force and creativity. And he has a sense of self that is, to, so far as I can tell, damn near unshakable. Not everybody has that. And not everybody s is raised the way he was raised. His mom was very specific with him about why she felt nonviolence was better, right? So, um, so he had thought a lot about this. So my own response to your comment and question is, I think everybody needs to have this as a possible tool in their toolkit, right? But not everybody's going to reach for it all the time. And, and he would disagree with me if he was standing here. Right. That's, and then you bring up about the prison. Right. That she was in such a defensive place. So let me just pause you for a minute. So for those of you who don't know this story, Joanne Little was a 20-year-old African-American woman who was in jailed for shoplifting in, I think, eastern North Carolina in 1975. And her, her prison guard, who was a 6'2", 220-pound man, white man, came in and tried to rape her. And she took his ice pick that he was using to force himself on her and stabbed him in the neck and he died. And she ran out of the jail. She was on the FBI's most 10 most wanted list. And her uh, attorney, who is a personal hero of mine who lives in Durham, Karen Bethea Shields, she actually defended her as a newly minted law, law grad. Um, and so it became a cause celeb for women in, in prison and particularly the peril of telling your story as an African-American woman um, accusing a white man of rape. She was eventually um, turned herself in and, and was found um, not guilty. But did you want to bring that forward in, a, in that context of nonviolence? Well, you know, the, the violent right. What were her options? Right. Yeah, I, I, somebody in the room might know more than me. Is anybody? I don't remember what his. Thank you for your comment. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think I think you know, uh, and the concept of you know reading civil rights history and everything, and looking at the concept of nonviolence, there was no option to that because you have to realize on a while individual frustration, and I know uh, reading about Congressman Lewis, as a matter of fact, you know, Stokely Carmichael, you know, uh, eventually upseated him from uh, the chairman of the S SNCC because you know. Right. Stokey, you know, came up with black power and, you know, and had more of a violence flavor to it, protect yourself. But I think on the wide scale social collective movement, nonviolence, you know, there was, that was the only practical option because what we fail to realize is that the government sanctions most of this. I mean, we go to the origins of nonviolence, you know, to India, to Mahatma Gandhi, um, you know, they the British, they were the government. I mean, they had control and control of the, of the country. So the only movement was to be nonviolent because certainly you cannot go up against the government <laughs> as citizens collectively when you have nothing. But we, you know, we live in a society, and as Martin Luther King said, we may have, you know, we may have tr uh, trials and tribulations, but the it swing, you know, the, the, the morality that that, uh, that the that arc of the universe is long, it swings toward morality, and I think that's the principle which nonviolence operates on, mm -hmm. that you cannot stand and see people mistreated, you know, when it's brought to the screen as much as it, it will go on in isolation. So, you know, looking at, looking at slavery, looking at uh, the laws that were present, they were passed and sanctioned by the government. So when one approaches that collectively, you, uh, the only option is non nonviolence. Uh, as John F. Kennedy said, watching Bull Connor in Birmingham, he thinks Bull Connor did more to aid the civil rights <laughs> movement than the other aspect because of what he brought to the screen. You know, holes and dogs on women and children, you know. I mean, even, even your most, uh, you know, your most, <laughs> most racist will say, wow, that's just inhumane. So I think 
Um, you know, I think the concept, you know, which King got from, uh, you know, Gandhi, and, and, and a name comes up, you don't see history, how like being a Rustin helped King, you know, uh, you know, develop this, you know, uh, this, the concept of nonviolence. I think there was no option, as King kept pointing out when people kept getting frustrated, because you were going up against entrenched governmental laws and practices, and they had all the weapons from the, the National Guard to the Army to everything, the local police. There was no option but nonviolence, no matter how much frustrated people may get on an isolated individual level. Collectively, there was no other option except nonviolence. So I think you bring up a really good point and articulated it at length, and that is really helpful. I do think that, and, and you know, there's famous encounters, right? So somebody came up to Malcolm X when he was in Harlem and said, um, well, how many guns do you have? And Malcolm X told him how much the, the mosque had, and, and he said, well, how's that going to suit you when the New York National Guard comes out, right? And so th it is a practical question. Right? How do you how do you assert yourself and your own integrity and dignity in an environment where there's white supremacist government? Right? How do you do that? And certainly, strategic nonviolence is part of it. I think what Lewis would say if he was here was that his belief in nonviolence as a way of life is goes a step beyond that. That it allowed him a freedom from white supremacy that he didn't expect to encounter in his lifetime. But not many people within the movement got there. They took a different path. So I just find that interesting. Diane Nash got there, and he did, and Bernard Lafayette, not too many others. Yes, ma'am. In spite of whether you use nonviolence or violence to protect yourself, it just amazes me how all of this was done toward people by people who called themselves God-fearing, moral, Bible-toting folks. Mm -hmm. And I, just, I want somebody to expand on that as to how you even say that you're God-fearing and moral and you allow stuff like this to continue to go on and on and on and even now it's about take back our country, and I'm saying, and who did you take it from? So where's the morality, and where are people talking about that? Because I saw some heads shaking when you were showing up here on the screen. That was nothing compared to what went on for 300 years. Mm-hmm. This, this was minor stuff. The other was pure hell. So I'm a historian, and I will say that part of what we would need up here to address that accurately would be a sociologist and a psychologist, because part of what we're dealing with, it, with your question is how people rationalize evil behavior. Right, so there. Correct. Right, unless we think we have our. Rationalizations, right? I mean, I can tell you as a historian. I will. Um, so I think I can tell you evidentially what the historical record shows about how we justify these these um, genocidal intentions, actions, and institutions, right? I can show you what happened with the evidence. I'm on much less solid ground as a historian to explain why the human mind can do that. 
So I think that we're veering into the sociology, the psychology, and the and the theolo you know the theological when we when we try to figure out why. So I don't, I don't want to dodge your question because I think it's a profound and important one. I just know that I am not equipped. I can I can speculate like the rest of us, and I can certainly say that there was a lot of people making that um, for everybody from upstanding uh, Baptist and Methodist white ministers throughout the Deep South all the way through the White Citizens Council and the Klan, using the Bible to justify segregation, slavery, um, murder, right? Uh, so I can show you that historically, but I can't answer the why. Does the what? Yeah. Address some of that. Yeah, it does. And there's a guy named Joel Williamson who's actually tried to engage some of this about particularly why white men have been so sexually sadistic towards black men and black women. Um, but but I just, I feel like we don't know enough yet. I mean, not as historians, we don't. <laughs>